one of the biggest, most frequent questions I get in my comment section and in my email inbox is can you please help me figure out how to find off-grid land, how to vet it, how to afford it, give me some tips and advice. So this video is going to answer all those questions. I'm going to take you to some off-grid properties. We're going to be hands-on evaluations of properties that are for sale. And I'm going to show you the off-grid property we just bought in interior Alaska, completely sight unseen. See what you guys think. Over the past 25 years, Dave and I have bought and developed six off-grid properties in Michigan and Alaska. We've learned a lot along the way. We've learned how to spot some of the trouble you might get into. We've learned to look at properties with an eye for potential, with an eye for sweat equity. We've learned how to do it out of pocket. We wanna share that information here with you today, so hopefully this will be helpful for you as you're looking for your off-grid property. Stay tuned. Okay, as you saw, we just drove into this property. This is off-grid. This is a five-acre piece. And let's take a look at the characteristics of this place, the pros and cons. We'll see if it's worth the price of admission. Let's go check it out. First off, let's talk about where do you go to find off-grid land? Well, first you need to know where you want to be. Then you get boots on the ground. You start driving around the area. You start seeing the area, get a feel for it. What is the economy like in the area? What is the land like? What's the people like? What's the climate like? And it has to speak to you. So start driving around, but then you're gonna look at local realtors, though so that's usually not where we have the best luck. Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist. Um, a lot of times it'll be for sale by owners. If you're just driving around back roads, you might see some for sale by owner stuff. If you go to Realtor.com or Zillow, any of those online sites, top your search at like $50,000 or $75,000. And I know that's still a lot of money, but that's going to filter out all kinds of stuff right from the beginning and start from the bottom up. Over the years, we've found a lot of land um, ends up being people's broken dreams for sale. So there may or may not be structures on the property. And that's something you have to think about when you're purchasing land and looking at off-grid property is what's already there, it, can it be salvaged? Does it have potential? Will it uh, bleed you dry trying to fix what's there? I'm gonna show you a really interesting one here after this one. So there's so many things to think about when you're searching for that piece of land, but you know, let's be honest, price is going to be right there at the top. The perfect piece of land with uh, great climate and water access in like a stream and a creek and fresh water and good soil and great access and great sun exposure, all of those things only come with lots and lots of money. So you're going to have to find out which areas you're willing to sacrifice to do what you can to afford a piece of land. So it's not gonna be perfect. Our first piece of land had leftover stuff on it, had old fencing, old animal corrals and shelters and sort of a driveway. Somebody's broken dreams once again, but it was uh, a couple of acres and then a couple acres beside it were for sale. So for like 12 grand, we got like four acres. And the power company had come through and cut some logs. So there was some logs already down. Even though we weren't tied into the grid, those were our logs. So we used those logs to build a little 12 by 12 cabin. And there we had our own piece of land, our own cabin that we built with our hands for nothing. So that's how you start. You start very small with what you can do, with what you can afford. As soon as you start to go bigger than that, you're gonna, you're gonna lose. You have to stick with what you can afford and the sacrifices you're willing to make. And that means with the land itself as a starter piece, or with life in general, the no running water, the no electricity, all of those things, hauling water is a big deal. It's really hard. How hard is your access? How easy is, is it to get into the property? Um, what about year round access? And we're gonna get into all of this, but right now let's just look at this property. This property is being offered for $48,000. It's way too much money for this, in my opinion. Um, it does come with a cabin and some other building, which I, I can't go in, I didn't call. To, to get access inside. I just wanted to see the land. You first just want to get a feel for the land. Like, do you see yourself here? Is this some place that uh, speaks to you? Dave and I have always gone off the premise 
does this land speak to you? And every piece of property we've ever bought, you know, we've gone back and we've gone back again. It's like, yeah, you know, I just, I, I kind of like it here. So let's take a quick look at this place and what it has to offer. And I'll give my, my thoughts on that. So you can see they obviously have brought in a ton of gravel um, to get this driveway in and just to get back here. This is a typical interior Alaska location with just a ton of black spruce. But they have interestingly cleared out this giant section and left a few birch trees. Um, so the fire danger here is much, you're much more protected in case of a fire, though black spruce is still every, everywhere. When you're looking at your land, is it prone to fire? Are these trees, you know, really, really flammable? We like this piece because these aspen aren't as, you know, the fire danger that like say black spruce is. This is a much better uh, piece of land for fire protection than would be black spruce, though fire is always gonna be, gonna be a concern no matter what. And black spruce in Alaska is very indicative of very poor draining soils, permafrost, what have you. And so that's definitely what this place is. Now, since they've cleared this, it's coming back. It's got lots of birch coming up. It's got little spruce, probably black spruce. Um, I'm sure that the, uh, the, the moose come in here and browse on all this. It's, it's probably a great spot to see moose. This is a, an awesome place to watch the Northern Lights. It would be just fantastic here. <laughs> so yeah, could you do something here? You would have to uh, amend the soil for sure. It's, this is just very silty soil around here. It, it's not very nutrient dense. So you would have to figure out how to make the soil better. But I mean, you could, you know, have an amazing garden here. You'd have to really protect it from the moose. But uh, you know, you could do something with this open space. I do like the open space. It does help with mosquitoes. You know, this place is gonna be great for solar, but when it's 80, um, it's gonna be brutal. There's absolutely no shade here at all. Um, so, you know, and it gets hot here quite often. So it's something to think about. This is obviously an owner built cabin. So let's go take a look at that. So when you're evaluating structures and the worth of structures, you wanna pay close attention to the roof. You wanna pay close attention to the foundation. What's this thing um, built on? Looks like this is built on railroad ties. So, I mean, it's not awesome. The rest you can't see because they've got it covered up. Now here's an example of a post and pad foundation. This is our cabin north of Fairbanks. Dave poured these concrete piers and also poured the square concrete pads underneath. This foundation is, is post and pad. We're on a big slope here. We're building directly on top of the ground. You can see the, the land drops right off here. Now here's the cabin. The foundation here is really, really sketchy. I go this way. I think this thing is just ready to fall off the mountain here. Quite a view, right? I've always wanted to own this little cabin, actually. No idea who owns it, and they're never here. The first thing you'd have to do is fix that foundation, which is pretty much non-existent. That board there is twisted as all get out and sitting on cribbing and just jacked up. Northern Lights would be incredible up here. But yeah, this place has always been one of my favorites, despite the work it needs. It does have a metal roof, and that's what's been saving it all this time because it's just OSB. It is what it is. It's always open. It's kind of just a uh, survival cabin, honestly. It's cool. I put a loft in it and sit here and watch the Northern Lights. Quite a view. Main thing is how's the roof? Piece blew off. Now we've got exposed wood, which is definitely bad. So you gotta check the whole thing out, top to bottom. It's probably 14 by 16 with a loft inside. They have a wood stove in there and obviously have some kind of a drip stove, like a, uh, a Toyo stove, very popular here in interior Alaska. Cause there's the uh, oil tank. 
When you're looking at roofs, you want to look at the overhang and the eaves and any damage. This is just T, T111 on the outside. Again, you can't see any of the foundation because it's covered up. Got, I don't know, whatever in the heck is in these. I do smell oil here. So there's either a drip or uh, a leak of some kind in the, in the connection. So that's not awesome because I can smell it. Quite a few solar panels. I'd be interested to see the inside and see what's going on in there. Oh, let's see if we can get in here and look. No, you can't see anything in there. Looking at the windows, they look like double paned windows there. It's not a bad window. More unknown things in jugs. Um, good steel door on the inside. It's good and warm. A pretty good screen door too. One thing I'm noticing here is that's like a 10 inch board. This thing would be very, very warm if the walls are 10 inches in there. But that the casing, what I'm seeing is, is a very deep casing on that window. Not too many windows. Uh, for what this is, I would definitely want way more windows. And I don't know if this building is just like a little storage building. I'm kind of guessing it is. And this thing only has the one little window and it is broken. Good steel door. Looks like it was just brought in. It's just sitting on some janky timbers. <laughs> the roof metal's a little jacked up. No window on the back. Some metal has come off of this thing. On that edge, it looks like. No one's been here in a really long time. Not completely protected, but I mean, it's a building, it's intact. You could probably do something with it. And the same for this one, but nothing you can do with this property besides clear it out, which is exactly what they did. Hey buddy, here's the outhouse. Hasn't been used in a long, long time. Let's look down the hole. Squirrels have been in here. Let's see if you can see it. There is a barrel sunk in because the soils here do not drain. So you would have to have some way to clean it out. Um, so that's going to be something to think about. It's going to be an issue. $48,000 is a lot of money for this, this off-grid place. Way too much in my opinion. This property to me has, it does have a little charm. I like the open space much better than being in all the black spruce. It'd be amazing to watch the sky here in the winter. Um, might be all you're doing though. <laughs> you can make that into a little office. I'm gonna check my phone. I want to see if there's actual cell coverage here. That's something else you got to think of. What are you gonna do? If you're stuck, you can't get out. How are you gonna keep yourself employed in this area at this place that you want to live, this off-grid property? How are you gonna make money? All right, I've got two bars here. That's kind of amazing that if you're working from home and the internet's part of your deal, this is something you want to look at. One thing to remember, how are you going to afford this? These places are not going to get financed by a bank. You need cash and cash talks, especially the longer a place sits. So the more cleanup, the more work that needs to be done, the more, the more off-grid it is, the more less attractive the land is, cash talks. And that's the only way you're going to buy this property anyway. You can sometimes get a land loan with 20, sometimes 30% down. That's still a lot of money. And uh, you still got to make a living out here, so think about that. So this one, there's this one. So now I'm going to kind of drive around this area, see what else is in the area, see if there's other cabins. I've already Google Earthed it. I kind of know what's here, and that's important to do. Look at the uh, if it's in a county or if you can get to acrevalue.com. You can do an overview. You can see who the landowners are in the area. I'll put the links below to those, the acre value. Um, it's a wonderful resource. It is not available here in Alaska. Um, if you live in a borough that has taxes, land taxes, you can track that stuff down. Otherwise, you're not going to know who lives around you unless you just physically, you know, drive or walk around. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to, the, the, the trail keeps going and then goes this way. I'm going to go check it out, see the, the land, see what else is here. All right, now we're just going to go look at a five acre piece of land here. No structures. We do have a partial driveway here. Old, hasn't been used. Bunch of logs over it, but uh, let's go take a look at the land. This piece is 35,000 for five acres. That's where you would come in. Here again, we have black spruce, but they're much bigger. I mean, this is about as big as they get. 
So the land is pretty dense with black spruce. And this is basically the building site. Now this piece of property is actually on a paved road quite a ways off the beaten path, long ways from a town, but there is power on this road. You could actually tap into power, but if that's not what you're looking for, then you're paying for that without ever gonna use it. So the fact that there's power on the road and it is a paved road, it's a rough paved road, um, that also means the access is going to be wonderful. There's year round access here. This road is getting maintained by the road commission. The land, meh, 35. I think it's still too much for this. You know, this has a few bigger trees, not much of a mix at all, pretty much just spruce. So this is not gonna be a place where you're gonna garden. The, the ground is just really thick, uh, mossy bottom. You're gonna wanna do anything back here. It's gonna start with clearing a path and then bringing in a bunch of gravel. Water is probably pretty deep. You could do rain catchment, but that doesn't always uh, guarantee you're gonna have water especially in interior Alaska, can be very dry. Here is our source of bathing water. This is coming off the shed roof. We have a nice uh, metal roof here and it's collecting into this rain barrel. And what do you notice is that there's hardly any water in there. We are in some pretty desperate times for, for water. We, we've had hardly any, any rain for several weeks. Is your source of, of water reliable? Are you gonna are you gonna have good water that you can rely on? The thing to really consider is your water source. Where are you gonna get water if you can't rely on rainwater? You gotta know where you can get your water year round. So figure that out too. All right. So this is where I come locally to get water. This is a spring that is provided for the community to get water, and uh, it's it's just the best water ever. So we get these big five gallon jugs and then I just do like my road water and fill it up here. So a lot of places in Alaska, you find these springs, where you can get water. You can find, you know, state parks where you can get water, but it's something you have to think about. This place is open year round and the water just keeps flowing. Okay, wow, that was pretty great. Oh yeah, look at that. That was about a half an hour's worth of rain. That's beautiful. Now we've got bathing water in here. You see all the pollen in the water, but otherwise, yeah, it's good for bathing and dishes even. Man, because this five acres is so dense, like I don't know what you would do with it. it as a value, of the property, you know, it's a buffer for privacy, but other than that, what are you gonna use it for? So a couple of things when you come on a piece of land, you gotta be honest with yourself about the price. Can you afford it? Are you living debt free already? Have you saved money? Can you build something yourself? Or are you going to have to pay to have something built? Is there material on the property that you could use to build the structure you wanna build? This one, honestly, yeah. These trees here are big enough where, that you could actually, you could actually do a cabin um, if you cut some of these logs down. Um, you see by the size of my hand, you'd get a good, you know, eight inch log out of that. And there's, there's quite a few of those around. Um, you're gonna have to work hard at getting them out of here. You're gonna need some, some trails cut and you gotta get, you know, four wheel drive and um, you're gonna have to cut trees and make it happen yourself, but it could be done. So this is our property that is north of Fairbanks and it is an off-grid property. And you can see it's full of aspens, which we utilized for building our cabin. And it's an unconventional kind of log to use, but you can see that it's, it's held up really, really well. As long as you've got good eaves and the wood is sealed, it makes for a really beautiful cabin. And that all came from these aspen trees, which is the resource we had on this property. So that's what we used. Um, if you're very new at building, 
this may all just seem overwhelming. So that's where the other piece might be more attractive, where there already is a small structure and another small structure that you can start with and, and you can redo it, you can revamp it and, and you can make it your own without actually starting from scratch um, without a building. Here's some land. Is it, is it what you want? Is it gonna give you what you want? This one has access. This one has power if someday you wanted to tap into it, which also makes this land more valuable both to start with and at the end game. So, you know, the more remote, the more off grid, the more you are removed from access and power, the less expensive it gets. But there is a, there's a value exchange there too for you because you're going to have to make up that difference. You're going to have to get power, you know, whether it be solar, you're going to have to access the property. You're going to have to take care of that road, maintain that road so you can get back in there. So there's so much to think about. Do you have to build? Do you have the skills? And if you don't have skills to build, that's not a deal breaker. I'll put the link below to my brother-in-law Scott's cabin that he, he built just in sections and he just started small and he went bigger and bigger, you know, and just added little rooms off and it can be completely done on a really small scale. So I'll put the link below to that and it's worth a watch and it's very inspiring. If you don't have any experience and just want to start small, go check out that video. Here's another, here's another selection of off-grid land and, and what to look at and what to look for. Oh wow, is that strawberry blight? What is that? Wow, those are all currants. Look at this. I've never seen so many currants in my life. Holy cow, this whole berm. So it looks like what, what they did was push all this land to flatten it out and they just pushed it into this pile, which is now your problem to deal with. It's probably 10 feet above the rest of the, uh, the cleared out area here, so. And what kind of wildlife do you have in the area? Are there, are there predators? Are there scavengers? Are there dangerous moose? There's one now. You gotta think about these things. It's nice and quiet out here. I will say that it is really nice and quiet. That's one thing I really pay attention to. So I don't know if you can hear behind me, but even though we're off grid and we're way out of town, we have a, a road that comes down the bottom of this valley that is well traveled. You're gonna hear traffic. It comes right up the mountain and I can hear it really easily at times. Other times it's not so bad, but it drives me crazy. <laughs> Uh, the land was cheap and we're glad we bought it, but the noise here, like the road noise from the one road, it just, the noise travels up and I just don't want to hear road noise. So it's kind of a bummer. The other thing right now is air traffic. We have major wildfires everywhere. So there is a tanker going by right now. Are you near a runway? Even if it's remote, you might not know it till you spend some time on the land before you buy it. One thing is you're evaluating trails coming into off-grid properties. You want to look for spots that may be uh, potentially low spots. You can tell it gets uh, flooded out, maybe it has ruts and stuff. Consider what time of year it is. You know, there may be problems with springtime and this being like super wet and muddy. Um, you want to look and see if the ground is hard or if it's, you know, here it's silty. So it's probably going to be fairly um, Barely solid underneath any water, but you know, something to keep in mind. Besides wet spots and, and stuff like that, you want to know if you have legal access. Do you have deeded access to this trail and this uh, road going into your property? It's good to know because at any point, if you don't have deeded access, it can be denied. <laughs> your access can be shut off by some other landowner. So it's a good thing to look into that. Um, do you need a four-wheel drive to get back in here? Could heavy equipment come in um, and help you with uh, bringing in gravel or equipment or, you know, materials and supplies? Does the road or trail, can it support heavy equipment or big trucks? These are things you want to think about based on what you're going to do with the land and your, and your ideas, but um, definitely things to think about. 
so as you evaluate your properties that you look at how are you going to get in and out of an off-grid property on an unmaintained trail or road that's a mile or miles off the main road you are the one that's going to have to maintain the wet spots and the holes that develop and putting gravel down in spots that need it and plowing or getting yourself in and out are you going to snow machine in and out are you going to bike at the very least you should ask yourself if you had to walk out are you physically able in case of an emergency you, you don't have any kind of transportation in or out of here can you get in and out on your own your own foot power that being said a few things you also want to think about is how close do you need to be to medical care um, is it important to have a hospital nearby or a clinic are you trained medically to take care of yourself you have basic knowledge in wilderness first aid and you and a kit to take care of yourself how close is the nearest school if you, you have school children are you considering homeschooling if you're going to be very isolated where's the nearest grocery store where's the nearest building supplies so consider all those things before you fall in love with a piece of land be really honest with yourself about year-round access what the weather's like and uh, go from there now a lot of times when Dave and I are looking for property uh, we'll initially go look at a piece and dismiss it and then we'll just kind of keep coming back to it um, for some reason it will have sparked something it will have spoke to us somehow or we have maybe have considered the potential in different ways and we will come back and visit a piece of property several times this property is that one for us we've considered buying this property um, so we've been here a couple of times to check it out and then we go back and discuss it and 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 then every time you come out here you get a different feel whether the weather's different um, you can hear different sounds whether the wind is blowing you can hear whether you can hear a road nearby this piece is more than a mile off the road it's completely off grid and completely isolated from any other um, structures or building around it so it is really a, a really interesting piece but it has so many problems or opportunities depending how you look at it so let's go take a look at what we're talking about now this is a 10 acre piece and right away the thing I like the most about it is this setting and this has just a really really great setting um, so we're gonna start out with the positives which is this is just a lovely setting and this place has some uh, real potential with the setting it also has um, some really nice outbuildings but the big elephant in the room is this giant owner built disaster I mean it is a disaster it's been sitting here forever and it is just hard to wrap your head around the amount of work that needs to go into dealing with this structure there is there is junk on this property from one side to the other but there are some bonuses and you have to be careful with the things that you do like because it'll it'll talk you into the place um, unfairly <laughs> and it'll make it worth more in your mind than it really is so it's got a really um, nice woodshed it's got a really nice chicken coop so this is good land here we've got some really nice uh, white spruce some cottonwoods and um, just a really beautiful setting so lots of sunlight lots of opportunities for gardens and all of that this place hasn't been lived in in a, such a long time again classic I don't know why you'd want a two-holer this one is actually dirt so this is good draining soil and, and you can have an outhouse that just drains nice privacy curtain there but mostly the rest of the land is black spruce now this place has a nice little chicken coop you got to think about uh, if you want to have homestead animals you know usually like chickens are the easiest to start with maybe ducks goats but how are you going to protect them what kind of predators are in the area what kind of fencing are you going to have to put up can you afford the fencing can you afford to have the animals like what kind of climate is it i know here in alaska i had chickens and i built like a straw bale coop for them so they had walls that were this thick of straw bales you know it, get, it can get 60 below here and we've seen it 60 below here so you've got to think about how are you going to take care of those animals how are you going to keep their water from freezing I, I had only rubber bowls so that I could you know beat them and the the ice would come out and I do that twice a day give them water and we were hauling water so you still have to think about where are you going to get that water 
to take care of your animals. Water, where's the nearest vet? Where are you gonna get your feed? Is there a feed store nearby? Are you gonna let them free range? If you're gonna let them free range, how about predators? So nice to have some structures already in place, but don't let that fool you into the making the value of that property more than it should be. Here's the butchering station for the chickens. Here's another um, nice outbuilding. And you can see that this would just be a really nice yard. I mean, it's, it's actually really beautiful. There's some building material. I'm sure it's just kind of junk. As far as the garden area goes, you're going to have to keep out deer and moose and rabbits, whatever else. Existing fencing or are you going to put in fencing for your garden? Things to think about. So right away, you see that this place has just been a conglomeration of owner-built ideas and it's actually really huge. This place is massive and it's really hard to see inside because absolutely every window or window hole has been covered up. But again, you start looking at what's here in the roof. Wood beyond the metal, which is always bad that wood's been exposed. I mean, that, that's just the start of the problem. Absolute disaster. There's just so much junk. So many weird add-ons and, but there's just so much junk. It's just been boarded up. You know, I'm guessing they must have had some solar up on the, uh, the roof up there. So I don't know what that whole contraption up there is about. There's actually no windows at all up there. It's all boarded up. There's a big investment in windows. The timbers are just exposed to the weather. It is just... Just crazy weird. So let's talk about the foundation here, which is just... Who knows? It's built right on the ground. Just got OSB all the way down. You can't even really see what's going on. This place is still standing. I mean, it's janky, but it's still up. It's a lot of insulation, this, this foam insulation in some spots. There's boards going past the metal, which is just really bad. It's just gonna rot out. Again, the least of the problems here. Give you, I'll give you a taste of what this place is like. I call this the, uh, the master bedroom. It smells like creosote in here. You can't see anything because it's just all dark and boarded up. This floor is just completely rounded. You'd have to put a new subfloor in here. Can you believe there's like a baby crib in here? It's super scary. Like, that's one room and this is supposed to be like a bathroom? I don't know. Another thing to think about with all this trash, all this scrap, all this whatever's here, is any of the land contaminated? Uh, especially where you want to grow something. So, you know, be aware of that and, and hauling off hazardous containers of whatever, oil, gas, old fuel oil. I mean, you just never know. So lots to think about with this particular property. Access, demolition, cleanup, renovation, tear down. What do you have the energy for? What do you have the appetite for? Do you have the money? Let's, let's sit on this one and lowball them because this is a nightmare, but it has ton of potential. You have to be able to see through all of this. We've done this many times on pieces of property where there's just been leftover dreams. We've cleaned it up and worked out really good for us because you can get it at the right price. And with sweat equity, you got something. All right, and so after all of what I've just told you, there's also the option to go completely rogue and buy something sight unseen. So here we are on a, on a new piece of property that Dave and I just purchased over the winter, sight unseen, with a caveat. We know this area. 
So we know what the land looks like. We kind of knew what the road was like. So this is interior Alaska as well. And this is an area we felt okay buying something sight unseen. This is on a maintained road. It's a maintained gravel road way far away from a town. Um, there actually is power on this road as well, but this land was so cheap. This piece was listed for $16,000. It was part of an estate sale. None of the family had any want of this property. So we made a really low offer. We offered $11,000 and they took it. Totally, totally has potential. And you know, we got this land cheaper than our first property we ever bought in Alaska. Oh yeah. And that was two acres. Actually, right. The first place was 6,500. Right. But it was just two acres. Yeah, so some of this property is just this deep black spruce, which is pretty much good for nothing. So for five acres of land for $11,000 is a smoking deal. You know that. We couldn't pass it up. Full of squirrels. Moose loves it here. Beautiful flowers. Interesting mix of trees on this property. But really, we bought it because the price was right. Just couldn't resist it. Oh, we have found the bunker. Wow. Yeah, this ridge is awesome. Yeah, it's definitely cool up here. It opens up and uh, it's got nice birch trees and... Yeah, if you clean this up and brushed it out, it'd be magic up here. I actually found a survival shelter back in here. This piece of property just keeps getting more and more interesting. This is really neat in here. Very cool. Some of the prettiest things in Alaska are these fireweed against birch or aspen. You just have to be really careful with buying something sight unseen for obvious reasons. You really, boots on the ground are the way to go. It's much better to do your homework, go actually vet the property, vet the area, and go from there. But occasionally good deals just can't be passed up. This dog wants to climb trees in the worst way. <laughs> we're, we're gonna figure this one out. This is gonna be a fun one to, to do something with. So there you have it, when it comes to land, there's so much to know and you're only gonna get there with experience and trial and error, but go into it smart, do your homework, and make the best decision for you. And remember not to be too intimidated by the thought of building your own place. Um, there's so many resources out there that can really take you like step by step for how to build. And remember to start with something small. I'm a big fan of books like this, building a shed, take you through the whole process, but you know, could start out to be a little tiny home, but it'll take you step by step through the building process. And you know, that may be just what you need. Larry Hahn, I love How to Build a House, Building Small by David and Jeannie Stiles. They've got line drawings in here and just inspiration for small spaces. You can build your own place if you really want to, even if you don't have any experience. I built a cabin last fall. I really have never built anything solo by myself. Hope you guys liked this video. Hope you got lots of good information and are psyched to go find your own piece of land. So good luck. See you in the next video, guys. This girl in the woods, she gone. Oh, don't forget to get outside and get happy. All right, I gotta get to work. See ya.